All right, cool. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because it is 40 after wherever you're at. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Scott and today I'm gonna be talking to you about the background on background tasks in .NET Core. I have already posted these slides both on my blog, which is just my first and last name.com, scottsauber.com, as well as I've dropped them in the Room 2 Slack channel as well. If you want to grab the slides now or and I've also posted a link to the code that I'll be using as well. So just to level set expectations really quick about some assumptions I had when I made this talk. Primarily I'm targeting .NET Core developers as the title suggests uh, or people who are just familiar with the .NET Core ASP.NET Core ecosystem and need to run a background task but are maybe unsure which options to choose from or maybe you know all the different options that are out there, but aren't quite sure when you should pick one or the other. So those are all things we're gonna talk about today and get those questions answered. We're gonna talk about what are background tasks and jobs, like when do you use those exactly, what options are out there, why would I choose one over the other, and we'll do a deep dive into each of these and understand really how they work and I'll do demos all throughout, and I'll also pay attention to questions in the Slack channel as best as I can, or at the very least, I'll hit them all at the end as well. So by the end of this, hopefully you know all your different options for running background tasks inside of .NET Core, as well as why you would choose one option over another. So quick, who am I? I am a software consultant based in Des Moines, Iowa, which is in the center of the US. And currently my wife is corralling my three and five-year-old daughters upstairs. So we'll see how well she does. Uh, but if you hear any laughing, crying, screaming, that may be what that is, but hopefully my mic doesn't pick all that up. I am also the co-organizer co of the Iowa.net user group. I'm a friend of Redgate and I blog as well, as I mentioned earlier. So before we talk about what options there are for running background tasks, let's just first level set real quick on why, what problems do background tasks solve and what would you use them for? So the prototypical example is some sort of cron job, some sort of uh, job that kicks off on some sort of timer. So you may pop messages off from a queue every five minutes or clean up your database or file system every so often. Or maybe every minute you want to check, should I send a payment reminder email or SMS to my customers? Or maybe you want to refresh some distributed cache every so often. And we'll actually look at an example of using uh, these different background task runners to refresh a Redis cache. Or maybe you want to check for updates to a database every so often and push those updates out through SignalR. Whatever it is, there's a million different scenarios for cron jobs uh, that you could be doing out there. And I'm sure many of you have similar operations such as these. You may also just want to perform some CPU intensive work that's outside of the normal request response pipeline in ASP.NET Core. So for instance, if you need to generate a million PDFs, you probably don't want to generate those right when somebody clicks the button. You probably want to just send them back a message saying, hey, we got your message and we'll notify you when that work is done and spin up real quickly, run all that work and then spin right back down. Another example of what background tasks solve is let's say you're doing some machine learning stuff and you need to retrain your machine learning models. Uh, you could also do that on a background task as well. And if anybody else has any other examples, uh, dropping them in the chat, either in WebEx or Slack, I'm sure that could spark some ideas for other people of things that they could be using background tasks for that maybe they're not today. So we're gonna talk about the top four options here. We're gonna talk about iHosted services, background services, worker services, and Hangfire, and go, into real, uh, de uh, go deep into all four of those. Um, I will touch on some of the various cloud options that are out there, but I'm not go, gonna go into uh, in depth about those because ultimately you may be running on Azure and another person may be running on AWS or GCP. So if I focus on one particular cloud offering, 
that may not make sense and may segment the market and uh, some of the audience members may uh, not have that be applicable to them. So I'm gonna target those top four that you see there because you can take those to any sort of cloud or run it on-prem if that's your scenario. So before we dive into the four options, I just kind of want to get this mental model brewing in people's heads. And in my opinion, these options are kind of like baking cookies. On one end of the spectrum, you have making your own recipe where you just have the raw ingredients thrown in front of you. And it's up to you to decide how you want to assemble them, how you want to cook them. And you just have full control over how you want to bake cookies. You can decide to make individual cookies if you want, or you can decide to just make one monster cookie cake. It's kind of up to you. But ultimately, you have full control, but that means also there's more burden on you as well. On the other end of the spectrum, you have going to the grocery store, the supermarket, and buying cookies directly right off the shelf. Obviously, that's way more convenient, but you have a lot less control over how those cookies are made, how they're packaged, all that kind of stuff. But depending on your requirements, you may choose to grab something right off the shelf, or you may choose to assemble your own cookie recipe. It's kind of up to you. So that's the mental model I'm going to present when I talk about these four options. So the first one we're going to talk about is iHosted Service. And in my opinion, iHosted Service is kind of one of those make your own recipe uh, examples where you're going to have the raw ingredients thrown out in front of you, but the cookie jar is included. And what I mean by that is the cookie jar is like the container for your cookies or for your code. And in this case, the cookie jar represents ASP.NET Core. And there's a little bit of a nuance there of technically you can host iHosted services outside of ASP.NET Core, but we'll talk about that nuance a little bit later. So what is an iHosted service exactly? Well, it lets you host a background job inside of an ASP.NET Core app, where again, ASP.NET Core, uh, the ASP.NET Core app is your cookie jar. As the name suggests, it is simply just an interface, and that interface exposes two methods that you need to implement, start async and stop async. And I bet you can guess what those two do. The way to think about iHosted service is it's just this raw, low-level, fundamental building block that other options and other components of ASP.NET Core itself build upon, including Kestrel. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. You can register iHosted services through dependency injection using services.addhostedof t, where t is the class that implements the iHosted service interface. We'll take a look at that here right now. So I'm going to do a demo of iHosted service. But before I do that, I'm just going to talk about what this project that I have here contains. So if I zoom in here a little bit, I have the shared project that is going to be used by multiple different, uh, multiple projects, multiple examples here. And there's not much code in here. There's just a few different pieces that I want to call out specifically. So there's this cache service, and I'll zoom in. If that's not good enough, please let me know in the chat. And I've got this cache service, and it's pretty simple. All it does is it takes in some dependencies, the iDistributed cache interface, which comes off of Microsoft.extensions.distributed and that package. And then I'm just implementing also injecting in a logger. And I've got this method here called refresh dashboard cache async. And the idea behind this method is it will just generate some random data here, simulating like I'm making a database call. So I've got this dashboard result class that I'm going to be sticking into cache. And all that has is your average sale, the last time this was updated, and the number of sales. So if I look at that, that's pretty simple POCO. And then we've also got the total sales, which is just a calculation of the number of sales times the average sale. So you can think of this as like simulating a very expensive database operation where, or maybe API calls where you're aggregating data from a lot of different sources and you don't want to make this call every time somebody visits your dashboard page. You just want to make it once every time your cache refreshes and then you just stick it in cache and then your API serves up that data from that cache. 
And here I'm just uh, serializing the results. And then I'm sticking it in. Sorry, can you? OK, sorry, I think my headset just cut out there for a little bit. Uh, so then in here, we're just going to set it to the cache, uh, the re local Redis instance that I have running locally. And then we're going to log out some information saying that, hey, I've refreshed the cache and everything's good to go. And then I just have a method here that's removing that cache key and purging uh, whatever's in my Redis cache uh, from Redis itself. So that's pretty much all you need to know from that. Oh, sorry, one other thing. We have this uh, service collections extension here where I'm just registering that cache service that I talked about. And then I'm setting up some logging to format the uh, logger to uh, echo out the timestamp in a specific way. So then we can read the logs and see how often the cache is refreshing. And then I'm just hooking up my local Redis instance here that again, I'm just running locally inside of Docker and I'm connecting it that way. So then I can reference this add demo services method in all of my projects. All right, so if I go to my hosted service example, let's just go ahead and start looking at the startup first. So you don't really have to worry about this configure method. We're not really doing anything crazy with the ASP.NET Core middleware pipeline itself. All we're doing is registered, rest, registering a hosted service here using the services.add hosted service and then giving it the implementation of my I hosted service. And if we actually dive into what this add hosted service is doing, it's basically just doing a try add singleton wh where try add singleton will guarantee that you only register one instance of that singleton. So if you accidentally call this uh, add hosted service method multiple times for the same hosted service, then you will actually only register one single instance and not multiple. So that's all it's doing under the hood is just a convenience method uh, for try add singleton. We're adding our controllers, not too much crazy there if you've been familiar with ASP.NET Core, and then we're registering the demo services that I mentioned earlier. So let's go ahead and look at the hosted service itself. You can see I'm just implementing the I hosted service interface with this long name of dashboard cache refresher hosted service. I bet you can't guess what my background service is called. The exact same thing minus background service. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But you can see here I'm just injecting in some resources here, the logger and that cache service we looked at. And then I've got this start async method that's just logging saying, hey, I've started the app. And then I'm calling this refresh cache async method, which we'll look at here in a second. But the other uh, method I need to implement being an I hosted service is stop async, where I'm just logging saying, hey, I'm stopping this job. And then I'm performing, performing some cleanup where I'm just clearing the cache in this case. But you can imagine plugging in whatever cleanup that you need to do here in stop async. Inside of refresh cache async, uh, not too much code here either. It's just saying, hey, while my application is running, so while the application is not notified that I am stopping, go ahead and try to refresh the cache. Otherwise, log out an error, and then wait five seconds and do it all over again for eternity until the application notifies that I am stopping. So that's a lot of talking. Let's go ahead and just run the app and see what it's doing under the hood. And I want you to note one thing. I am not awaiting this here. And we'll talk about why I'm not doing that here in a second. So the application is booting. And let's just zoom in here on the logs. Oh, sorry, one other thing I forgot to mention. I do have a controller here. It's a pretty simple controller. All I'm doing is grabbing the values from the cache and then returning them out. So nothing too crazy going on there at all. But if we go back to the logs from when my application booted, you can see here that it's saying start starting this hosted service. And you can see here I'm saying starting this hosted service. And then you'll notice you'll notice that it says dashboard cache was refreshed which is coming from 
this log statement here. So my Redis cache has been populated. And then you'll notice a little bit later that now I'm listening for requests. And we'll talk about why this happens after the hosted service has been registered or after the hosted service has started. And then you'll notice every five seconds, it's simply refreshing the cache here. So if I pull up my dashboard endpoint, you'll notice I've got uh, this piece of data here. When I refresh, my random data will then change. If I refresh again, notice it's the same for about five seconds. And then the data updates. So you can see there, it just changed. So this is an example of how you may use background services to refresh some distributed cache, or maybe just an in-memory cache if you've only got a single instance of your application running. Um, and this is also showing how you would use uh, hosted services that are kind of like a raw fundamental building block for the rest of this. All right. So how does, ad, how does I hosted service work under the hood? Well, again, you just register it with uh, dependency injection using the services.addHostedService. There is a bit of a gotcha with stop async. So stop async's cancellation token by default gives you five seconds to shut down gracefully. Now, this is assuming that there is a great graceful shutdown initiated. So something like the app pools recycling or something like that. However, you shouldn't rely on stop async to get called because uh, Rohan is asking to annotate. I'm gonna say no. Sorry, sorry, Rohan. Um, not really sure if that would show up for everybody or how that would work. But uh, so stop async might not get called if the app shuts down in some unexpected way. So you should not be building your hosted services assuming that start, stop async always gets called because again, there's no guarantee that it actually gets called. So how does I, an I hosted service work then exactly? Well, you can see here kind of in the center when ASP.NET Core boots up, it's going to boot up all of your iHosted services one after another, and it will actually do that in the order that you register them in your DI container. But one thing that you'll note is at the very end, after all the start asyncs complete, that's when Kestrel actually boots and starts listening for requests. So what this means is start async can actually block the rest of your app from starting. So in general, you probably want to push your blocking long running work outside of start async. And this goes for background service, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. So in general, you probably want to do what you see on the left, which is you're not awaiting your long running thing async. And on the right, you're waiting for that long running async to finish and the rest of your application will not serve any requests. If you're co-locating your iHosted service with an API, for instance, your API or your Razor Pages app or whatever, whatever it is that your ASP.NET Core app does will not be able to serve that traffic until all of your iHosted services complete start async. Now, maybe this is actually what you want it to do. So an example of this would be maybe you want to run your database migrations inside of an iHosted service. And so you want your database migrations to apply before your application actually finishes booting because maybe you don't want those two to be out of sync. Although you could argue you should probably be making your application be able to be fault tolerant to like your database version minus one, but we won't get into any of that. But like an example in my case, maybe I don't want the rest of my application to boot unless that Redis cache has been populated. So I could do something like that. But with my current implementation, if I go back to this code and say, hey, I actually want to await this guy and I'll make that async, get rid of this and I'll rerun the application. What will happen here is I'm gonna wait for this to finish, but it will actually never finish because my while loop is saying only finish when the application is starting to shut down. So what will actually happen here is I'm starting my hosted service. Oops, let me zoom in on that a little bit. I'm starting my hosted service, but 
my application never actually starts listening for requests to come in or starts listening for requests because Kestrel is not booting because I've never finished uh, the work for my I hosted service. So if I try and make this API call again, I'm going to get a timeout because again, my hosted service has not finished. So this is something that, that I see a lot and my headset kind of went out again for a second there. Um, this is something I see people get tripped up on a lot where they think that uh, they can just await, await something long running inside of start async, but that is actually not the case. And then they wonder why the rest of their application is not booting. So that is a gotcha to look out for. So when do I use iHosted service? Well, you will use it implicitly with background services and worker services and actually Hangfire as well. And you're actually using it implicitly if you're using Kestrel inside of ASP.NET Core, which I'm assuming all of you are. And But I don't think you should really use it directly unless you need full control over starting and stopping of your background job and you don't want to use the base background service implementation which we'll talk about a little bit uh, a little bit later so when do i not use this in my opinion you should be using something else such as background services or worker services 95 plus percent of the time other reasons not to use it would be the same as background service which we'll talk about a little bit or actually right now so background services Background services, if we go back to the cookie analogy, are kind of like a follow the recipe example where you don't have the raw ingredients laid out in front of you and you have to decide what recipe you're going to follow and you're just going to make one up on the fly. Background service gives you a recipe to follow and the cookie jar is included, where again, the cookie jar is your ASP.NET Core app. So again, background services just lets you host a background task runner inside of an ASP.NET Core app. And all a background service is, is an abstract class that implements the iHosted service interface. And it exposes an execute async abstract method to you to put your custom code in. And background service handles some of the starting and stopping logic with cancellation tokens, which we'll look at here in a second. So you don't have to worry about dealing with cancellation tokens if you're unfamiliar with how all those cancellation tokens and everything work. So let's do a demo of background service here. Just gonna go ahead and close that and open up the background service. Again, I'll start with the startup method which looks almost identical, except the only change is instead of the dashboard cache refresher hosted service, I'm, I'm uh, registering the dashboard cache refresher background service. So there's no add background service method. I've seen people wonder about that as well, but technically a background service is a hosted service because it implements that interface. So let's go ahead and look at this code here. So you can see a big difference is I'm inheriting from the background service abstract class. I'm still injecting in the exact same dependencies as before, but now I've got this start or this execute async method where when the job's starting, I'm saying, hey, uh, I'm gonna log out, I'm starting the job. And then I'll continue to do some work until the application shuts down. The exact same work I was doing earlier where I was trying to refresh the cache and then wait another five seconds. And then when the job ends, I stop, I log out that I'm stopping, and then I remove the, uh, or I purge the cache. So if I pull up the old code and kind of look at these side by side, you can see the code is pretty similar. There's just a little bit less code. So we have 46 lines here on the left and 57 on the right. So there's a little bit less code because there's a little less boilerplate that background service is actually handling for us. But you can see here the start async method, this is identical to this. And then this code is all identical to this. And this code right here in stop async is identical to this. So if I go ahead and stop the old hosted service and launch my background service, we will see the exact same behavior as the hosted service where it will just refresh the cache on a five second interval. You can see here it says it says it's starting up. 
Uh, it's starting up, and then it's refresh the cache. Now I'm listening for cache rolls booted up for me, and now I'm just refreshing that cache every five seconds. So again, it's the exact same behavior that we saw before, where my cache stays uh, up to date for five seconds. So exact same code, just implemented in a slightly different way using background services. So how does a background service work exactly? So a background service works uh, largely the same way. Uh, you register it with the add hosted service, just like you do with the hosted service, but then it exposes that execute async abstract method that we just looked at. But you can still override start async and stop async if you need to do something super custom. So if I come back over here, I can still say, Hey, override, and I'll get the options for start async and stop async. So if you don't like the implementation of what background service is doing, or you just need to hook into it in some way, you can still override that if you want. So just to break down this code here real quick, because there's actually not much code here that background service is doing. It's just kind of a convenience class for you. So as you can see here, there's not too much code, but let's go ahead and zoom in on that real quick. So it's got the, it's creating a cancellation token source, and then it's also giving you the abstract execute async method that you need to implement. And then inside of start async, it's saying, hey, I'm gonna store off the task that you have created here with execute async, and I'm gonna pass the cancellation token from this cancellation token source. And we'll, we'll take a look at how that all works together here in a second. If the task is already completed, go ahead and bubble that up. Otherwise, it's starting to run, so just return a completed task. Inside of stop async, if the task has not actually been called, so if this line here didn't actually execute because it called stop before it even called start, then go ahead and return out. Otherwise, tell that cancellation token source to uh, cancel. And you can see here that's the same, that stopping CTS field is the exact same field in both spots. So this is what's notifying your execute async method that, hey, the application is starting to stop. And then down here, we essentially have a race where it's saying, hey, when any of these tasks complete, go ahead and finish stopping. So either the executing task or the cancellation token itself, that'll give you about five seconds to stop. If either of those complete, then go ahead and finish the method and continue bubbling up and move on to the next hosted service that then has to stop and on and on and on. And then finally, just some cleanup in the dispose method here. So not too much going on in the background service and it actually takes away some of the boilerplate so you don't have to worry about it. So when do you use background service? If you need a very simple background task runner, either as part of your ASP.NET Core application, like some existing API that you have, or if you want to run it by itself, you absolutely can. It's got a few less foot guns than iHosted service does, so you can't accidentally prevent the rest of your app from, from booting unless you override start async. And it handles the cancellation tokens for you because a lot of times we uh, as developers may not do too much with cancellation tokens, so that may be an unfamiliar concept to some people, so it kind of handles some of that orchestration for you. Another reason to use a background service is if you want some sort of ASP.NET Core health check endpoint to check how your background task is doing. This would be a benefit of background services over worker services, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. When do I not use background services? Well, if you want to co-locate a background service with an existing app or an API, if you register too many background services, that can get a little unruly at times and can outweigh the convenience of co-locating. Because if you co-locate it with an existing app or like web app, like a Razor Pages app or an API, then you're gonna be sharing the same process, you're gonna be sharing the same CPU, memory, network, all that kind of stuff. So you could end up in a noisy neighbor situation where your background service is going a little haywire, which impact, negatively impacts the performance of your API, or vice versa, if your API is getting slammed, it could negatively impact the uh, resources of the background service. 
Now, I'm not necessarily advocating for putting background services in their own process, just it's an it depends scenario of which hurts less, putting them together and having one deployable or separating them and having two different deployables that maybe you need to uh, maintain uh, together or deploy together or something like that. Another, another thing, just went out again, sorry. My headset went out on my side. I'm not sure if that's happening to you guys or not. But um, anyway, continuing on. My, another thing that I've seen people struggle with is when they scale out, it can be a problem if your code is an item potent. Because say you scale out and you have multiple instances of the same application running, you're now multiple instances of the same background service running. So if your code is an item potent or it's got some sort of locking mechanism to ensure that only one is running at a time, or you're popping messages off of a queue that do, that um, if you had a, some sort of message queue that guaranteed only once delivery, you could avoid this as well. Or you could just make your application not allow scale out. Um, another situation where you can make your code item potent is you could check to see if the message has already been processed before you actually do the work. That way, if you're like firing off emails from your background service, uh, if you fire off emails from your background services, you're not emailing multiple times. Um, I've seen people get tripped up on that before with background services. So just a word of caution, uh, thinking about, think about scale out when you're creating these things. So the next one we're gonna talk about is worker services. So what is a worker service? A worker service, essentially all it is, is an enhanced .NET Core console app template that gives you a few more nice things out of the box. So you can just go to the command line and say .NET new worker dash O and give it the folder name you want it to spit that code out to. And it'll wire up a few different things for you when you do that. It allows you to have an iHost. So the same host that's used inside of ASP.NET Core. So things like configuration, dependency injection, logging, all that good stuff that you know with ASP.NET Core the worker service already has pre-hooked up for you. On top of that, it also creates a, registers a worker class as a hosted service. So it hooks it up to DI, as I mentioned earlier. So all you have to do from this point is just plug in your custom code and you're good to go. Now, what's different about a worker service than some of these other things is it does not take an opinion on how to host a console app. So, a worker service is kind of like a follow the recipe scenario, but it's got no cookie jar. It has no opinion on how you want to run your worker service, your console app. You could either call the console app from a scheduler, like a Windows scheduled task or a Kubernetes cron job or something like that. Or you could hook it up as a Windows service if you're on Windows or systemd if you're on Linux. It's kind of up to you. So let's do a demo of worker services real quick. I'm just gonna declare bankruptcy on my tabs here and go into the worker service. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is the program. And as, I, as you might expect with the console app, you just have a static void main, whoops. Static void main, that's creating your app and then running it. And you'll notice this probably looks very familiar if you've done ASP.core stuff, you're creating a host and let's just ignore these two lines here for a second. But you're also configuring services and I'm registering my demo services. And then I'm saying, hey, add me a hosted service of uh, this worker class, which is all pre-configured for you. Now, these two lines here, you can say that you want to host this inside of a Windows service or inside of systemd. And I've laid out these package names here with Microsoft.extensions.hosting.windowsservice and .systemd. You can leave both of these here. If you're on Linux, this one will no op. And if you're on Windows, this one will no op. So if you're hosting it in this uh, sort of way, if you have developers on multiple OSs, you can leave both of these here and it'll work when uh, any developer pulls down the code, whether they're running on Windows or Linux. So if I go in here and look at this background service or this worker class, 
I, you'll notice that this is the exact same code as I had in my other background service. And just to prove it to you, I look up the background service and go ahead and push that off to the side. This code, minus I was overriding the start async, is 100% identical. So this is what I was mentioning earlier when I said background services and iHosted services can technically run outside of ASP.NET Core. Uh, they can definitely run inside of things like a worker service. But in general, if you hear somebody say, hey, I'm running a worker service, they probably mean inside of a console app. And if they say, I'm running a background service or an iHosted service, they probably mean ASP.NET Core, although that one's a little bit fuzzier. But the cool thing is you could plug in this background service into an ASP.NET Core app and then decide later, actually, you know what? I need to bring that out to its own process because maybe it's causing some noisy neighbor situations. And literally, you don't really have to change any code. You can just take this code and drop it into this worker template and everything else is kind of hooked up for you. You just need to decide where am I going to host this? How am I going to kick this off? How am I going to install that? All that kind of stuff. So that abstraction is pretty powerful. So how does a worker service work exactly? Well, in your CS proj, the SDK type is of type worker instead of web. And the other thing to note is it automatically adds a package reference to microsoft.extensions.hosting so that you get the whole iHost create default builder stuff for you out of the box. There's not too much magic going on there behind the scenes. So how do I host worker services then if it's not an ASP.NET Core app? Well, you could do something like a scheduler calls your EXE directly. So using something like Windows Scheduled Tasks, Azure Logic Apps, Kubernetes Cron Jobs, AWS Scheduled Tasks, or GCP Cloud Scheduler. Or as I mentioned earlier, you could run it as a Windows service if you're on Windows or System D if you're on Linux. It's kind of up to you on how you want to host your worker services. When should I use worker services? If you want some sort of out of proc way of running a background task. So if you don't want to co-locate it with your existing ASP.NET Core app, a worker service is a great option. As well as if you just prefer hosting background services outside of the whole web app lifecycle, because you can get into some weird scenarios where, you know, maybe an app pool recycles in the middle of your background task running and just making sure that your code can handle that scenario. Um, you can just get into some weird scenarios with uh, kind of sticking a background task runner inside of a web app, which is more about like returning responses from a request. I also think worker services are a natural migration for anybody who's got an existing like .NET 4.5 full framework Windows service. You can obviously, like if you're happy with that hosting model, you can obviously just port the code over to a worker service and ho hook it up to uh, a Windows service and using a worker service, and you'll be good to go. When do I not use worker services? Well, if your team in general is more comfortable deploying and maintaining web apps, and you're not really too keen on having like Windows services or System D or something like that, maybe then you would lean towards more something like a background service or Hangfire, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Another reason not to use it would be as if you wanted to co-locate your worker service or your background service with an existing web app or API. So maybe you don't want to have multiple deployables. Um, you just want like have something really simple and you just want to host it with your existing app. You can totally do that with a background service, not so much with a worker service. Another thing uh, is if you want some sort of health check endpoint. So obviously with an API, you could add a health check endpoint saying, hey, is my worker, is my background service healthy? Is it processing messages? All that kind of stuff. With a worker service, you really can't do that because it's just a console app. So for that, you would have to do something like monitoring the behavior of the application. So if you're popping messages off of a queue, for instance, you would have to monitor how many message messages are piling up on the queue and do some sort of alerting or whatever you want to do on the health check uh, based off of that. 
So this next one we're going to talk about is hang fire, which I equate this to buying prepackaged cookies and where they kind of made the decision of how the cookies are assembled, how they're packaged and all that kind of stuff. You just have to decide how are you going to eat the cookies? Are you going to use milk or however you're going to eat the cookies that you buy off the shelf? So hang fires a open source library and for running jobs in ASP.NET Core. It is free for commu commercial use, but if you want support or some extra features, you'll have to pay ran ranging from Oh, I think I dropped there again. Sorry about that. Uh, as I mentioned, it's free for commercial use, but paid if you want some sort of support, such as $500. Uh, you'll have to pay ranging from $500 a year to $4,500 a year. Uh, it comes with a UI for monitoring and history, so you can see how your jobs are doing, as well as how they've well they've done in the past. We'll take a look at that here in a second. It supports cron jobs, so running things on a timer, or just ad hoc running of jobs. And we'll take a look at that here in a second. If you just want to do a one-off job and uh, chuck some custom code into a job in Hangfire. It also allows for things called continuations, where let's say you have step one, step two, and step three, and you need to coordinate those steps and have that happen in a particular order. It will allow you to set up these continuations where it will guarantee step one runs before step two and step two runs before step three. It also supports automatic retries. So you can, uh, it'll retry 10 times by default, but you can also configure that how you like. And it supports concurrency limiting. So you can guarantee that a job only runs uh, one, uh, one instance of the job is running instead of multiple instances. And it also persists the job state to a database. And so you can, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how all that works. So let's do a quick demo with Hangfire. And I'm just gonna declare bankruptcy on my tabs again. And let's actually, let's first open the CS proj. And so you can see, oops, see how, what packages I brought in. So these are the three packages uh, I brought in for Hangfire. So there's hangfire.asp.net core, and this hooks Hangfire up to the rest of the ASP.NET Core pipeline. And Hangfire itself is actually implemented as a iHosted service. So again, yet another thing that builds on top of iHosted service. And then this is like the shared library with all the common interfaces that Hangfire has, because you can actually run Hangfire on top of a uh, full framework ASP.NET. Uh, like we were talking about before the talk started. And then this is my persistence uh, package where I'm saying I want to persist it to SQL Server. I could also persist it to Redis or MSMQ, or I believe are the other two options. So let's go ahead and look at my startup for this. Um, I'm just registering some services with Hangfire. Thing to note here is I'm saying I want to use SQL Server. And again, I'm just running SQL Server locally inside of Docker. So I'm saying, hey, this is my connection string. And then there's a bunch of things that you can configure uh, if you want with Hangfire. I'm registering the Hangfire server to do all of the job processing. And then down here, I'm hooking up some of the middleware. So I'm saying, hey, I want to use the Hangfire dashboard. And let's go ahead and map the Hangfire dashboard as well. And so if you want to kick off a or set up some sort of cron job, you can do that a few different ways, but here's one of the ways. So you can say recurring job dot add or update and just give it an inline method saying, hey, I'm just going to call console write line and I'm going to run that every single minute. Or you can, and so when this persists to hang fire and shows you in the UI, it doesn't really know anything about this method. So all it's going to tell you is, hey, you ran a console write line method. So it just takes the method name as the job name. Alternatively, you can give it a specific job name. So you just do that with an attribute saying, hey, here's the job I want to uh, display inside of Hangfire. So let's go ahead and launch Hangfire here. And so while that's coming up, 
what this will do is it will launch the Hangfire dashboard so you can see uh, what's going on with all of your different cron jobs and uh, monitor them so you can see like the hist uh, history graph of how many times these jobs have run and whether they've succeeded or failed. You can get a real time graph showing you how much or how many times they've succeeded or failed. You can see what recurring jobs you set up. So you can see I've got this one that's console right line, which was that inline one that I showed a bit ago. And then I've got uh, this one here as well. And you can see it's got the custom name of custom job name. So I can actually go ahead and trigger these ad hoc if I want. And the console right line one finished immediately, but you can see this one uh, took at least five seconds because I had a five second delay here. And then we can go look at the history and see, okay, this custom job name took 5.2 seconds approximately to run. And this console right line one took about 200 milliseconds. I can dive into the details. They'll kind of tell me, hey, here's what triggered it. Here are the different parameters, how long it took, what server it ran on, all that kind of stuff. Another piece of code I have in here is in the hang, this Hangfire controller, I've got a way to kick off a background job just kind of ad hoc. So if you have something like, hey, I want to fire off an email, um, you can use this NQ method. Say, uh, I want you to create a job. And in this case, I'm saying, hey, this is, uh, I'm passing the parameters of hello from controller. And I'm actually using that inside of the job name. So this curly brace zero is kind of like a string dot format where it's gonna place in the parameters that I pass to this method. So you'll see it'll say hello from controller with dash hello, uh, trigger from controller with hello from the controller. So if I come over here and make this API call to hangfire, simulate that API call, you can see now it's processing and saying, hey, triggered from controller, hello from the controller, and go look at how it performed and see what the parameters were and then how long it took and all that same good stuff. You can also do things like deleting jobs. Not sure why you would set up a job just to delete it and from a recurring perspective, but you totally can. Um, if you wanted to like stop a job in the middle, technically when it's processing, you could also check the box and say delete job as well. But let's say I throw an exception here and just say, oops, something happened, right? I'm just gonna rerun the app and I'll show you kind of how the retries work within Hangfire. And writer's yelling at me saying I've got some unreachable code, which is fine because I want that to happen. So my app's booted up, if I refresh this, you can see immediately it chucked it into this retry queue. And so it'll actually do an exponential back off, but I'll just keep enqueuing it and then it'll keep failing. And you'll see the back off will continue increasing. So now it's retrying in a minute instead of a second. If I enqueue it again, it'll enqueue uh, in three minutes and it'll just keep going on and on and on. Eventually, if these all fail, it'll end up into this failed like dead letter queue essentially saying, hey, this job failed and it never succeeded. So that is a quick overview of Hangfire. You could probably do a whole uh, hour long talk on Hangfire if you wanted, but that's a quick overview of some of the features. So how does it work? As we were kind of talking about earlier before this talk started, uh, it's Hangfire serializes the method call and all of its arguments. So it'll take those and it'll create a background job based on that info and then save that job to its persistent storage. So in my case, that was SQL Server. So the arguments to that NQ method will actually go into the database. So in general, you don't wanna put a lot of data in there because that will end up in the database. You might wanna just put like an ID or something like that uh, into your argument. And then it'll start the background job immediately if it's uh, like an NQ situation where you wanna start the background job immediately and not delay it or be on some sort of cron job. So when should you use Hangfire? If you want to host jobs inside of ASP.9 Core and you need some of the features that Hangfire offers and you don't want to write that plumbing code yourself. 
as well as if you're okay relying on a third-party open source library, whereas the other three options that we talked about were kind of baked into the .NET Core framework itself. When should you not use Hangfire? If you do not want to host your jobs in ASP.NET Core and you want to use something like a worker service because you want to avoid the uh, like web server uh, lifecycle, then you would use something like worker services over Hangfire and ASP.NET Core. If you just have really basic needs and you don't need Hangfire's features, uh, that would be another reason not to use Hangfire, as well as if you don't want to rely on a third-party library and you want to just use something more built into the box like a uh, background service. So, uh, Sorry, sorry, I think I'm back now. I'm not sure why my headset keeps doing that, but um, another, some other options that you have that I didn't really want to cover are some of your cloud options. So I didn't want to cover these again, because in case you're on AWS, if I cover Azure Functions, that might not apply to you, as well as there's a lot of talks here at NDC Sydney on serverless options. So, but some of these options, if they apply to you, uh, would be something like Azure Functions triggering off of a timer or an event or Azure Web Jobs. Same with AWS Lambdas, you can trigger those off of some sort of cron schedule or off of an event happening. Uh, GCP Cloud Scheduler uh, combined with Cloud Functions could also do similar things to what I've shown here with uh, hosted services, background services, uh, worker services, and Hangfire. But again, I didn't want to cover these to get very cloud specific. So some takeaways, hopefully I've brought some awareness to the options that are available to you and maybe one of those resonated more with you so you can make the best decision for you and your company or your client and choose the best option that makes sense for your scenarios. I've got some resources here. Uh, so the official Microsoft documentation has a bunch uh, of Examples using background services and hosted services and worker services. The official Hangfire docs are at hangfire.io. And then Steve Gordon, who's a prolific .NET blogger, he has a plural site on worker services and hosted services, which by the way, the uh, plural site is free this week. So you can go ahead and check that out. It's about a two hour long course where he kind of dives into how all this works under the hood. So with that, I'll take any questions people may have. We've got about eight minutes left. If you want to drop them into Slack, or it looks like we've got a few in the chat. They're on WebEx. Uh, looks like, OK, when your headset drops out, the audio stops for a second for the audience, but every time it started again, so I'll get it. OK, cool. Out of both the implementations, which one is good for executing poly retries? So um, it kind of depends on how you're using poly. Like I've used poly for use for retrying like API calls and stuff like that. So to me, that's kind of irrelevant to running background tasks themselves. It would just poly would be kind of implemented inside of my code, and then I would still have like a while loop. Uh, running on a timer or something like that inside of a background service where I just, uh, you know, can try catch. I guess you could wrap the whole thing inside of a poly policy, but um, you just want to make sure that your policy is obviously set up correctly so then you can uh, retry appropriately or kind of do what I did and just have a try catch and just retry on some sort of interval. When to go hang fire over web job? Uh, I'm guessing you're talking about Azure web jobs. Um, so a reason to use hang fire over Azure web jobs, obviously if you're on-prem, you would probably choose hang fire since you can't go to Azure. Um, to be honest, I haven't really used Azure web jobs in a while. So I'm not really sure why I would choose web jobs over hang fire. I'm trying to think of a reason, but in general, I would probably lean towards using Hangfire over web jobs or lean towards like having an Azure function trigger on some event like uh, some blob storage uh, item getting added or 
on some sort of schedule or um, something getting dropped into a queue, something like that. So I'd probably lean that over web jobs in general if you want to host something on Azure and you don't really want to go all in on Hangfire. If we are interested in doing something for failed background tasks, could we hang, handle those exceptions in Hangfire? Uh, yes. So by default, if it throws an exception, it will retry those 10 times. But uh, I've also written code before where, hey, if it's some sort of transient failure, like the database is down or the API is down, uh, I'll just go ahead and keep retrying. But otherwise, if it's some unexpected error, like I've just got a bug in my code, you don't really want to retry that 10 times because it's just going to fail 10 times in a row. And if you have notifications hooked up to your jobs failing, you're not going to find out for four or five hours when that exponential back off happens. So um, there's, I can't remember the name of it now, there's a filter that you can implement in Hangfire to say, hey, um, just bypass the failed state, or just immediately go to the failed state and bypass the retry policy. So if you want to handle those certain types of exceptions in a certain way, um, you can completely bypass the retry policy and fail, fail hard and fail fast. And I'll try, I'll, I'll get the interface for that and I'll post uh, an example in Slack. Which would be best for reading messages from a queue and sending it to a stream processor like Kafka? Um, again, it just kind of depends on whether you want to host inside of ASP.NET Core, if you want that inside of a worker service, it kind of depends on uh, what your load constraints are, if you prefer having a health check endpoint, I don't know that there's really a best one. It's kind of, it depends on your various scenarios. Sorry, I know that answer isn't exactly straightforward, but it is, as always, it depends. In a microservice architecture, would you recommend Hangfire running on each microservice? Would you have them share the same SQL database or each microservice have their own Hangfire database? Uh, this is gonna be another it depends scenario. Um, Basically, it depends on hosting multiple Hangfire instances. Would you want them to be unified under like a single dashboard, or would you want them under multiple dashboards? What's the load that you would have? Um, those are the kind of questions that I would ask of what kind of load would we have? Maybe if you have high load, you would separate those out into separate uh, Hangfire instances, but I'd definitely run some sort of load tests to understand what my constraints were there. Um, in general, I lean towards making it easy to operate. So I would lean towards unifying it under one dashboard. You can have multiple servers and workers running on Hangfire. So if you want need to distribute the load, you could add multiple servers, but then have them roll up under the same dashboard. And they have documentation on how to do all that. And if you have questions later, you can always reach out to me uh, through Slack or hit me up on Twitter, or you can go to my blog. I've got a contact uh, page there too. You can reach out to me there as well.